About three years ago, a buddy named Will and I went kayaking and sluice logging. I think a combination of hiking and swimming in the Loxahatchee remnant of the Everglades. I had just gotten engaged to my girlfriend of seven years, and he was celebrating three years of avoiding painkillers and sticking towards weed. <laughs> and that started after our third amigo, Corey Walton, passed away from an overdose. Now, Will had been partially responsible and fled instead of calling the police to avoid trouble, and uh, he never forgave himself. I had difficulty with it from time to time, so I tried to consider not hating him for it and considered it a burden to work on, and he agreed to work on his painkiller habit. So we had brought some shrooms and weed with us to really enjoy the wilderness. And our friendship went back more than 15 years, all the way to our high school group of hooligans, so I couldn't just, couldn't just give up on him. My name is Jason Grover. And this is the story of what me and my friend found in the swamp. We paddled out with our old kayaks from Arthur R. Marshall Park in West Palm Beach, Florida. We planned so that we could go camping a few miles in, grill up some fish, enjoy Mother Nature. We decided to go much deeper in than we normally did, but our adventures had become a ritual one since Will started getting clean. We had a variety of GPS devices so that we didn't go missing like, well, so many others. After four or five hours, we noticed it was getting dark, and Will suggested that we find a good spot to camp. Hey man, check out this tunnel, Will suggested, pointing at a waterway that went below a thick canopy of trees that formed a tunnel-like structure. And there are plenty of invasive species, like Australian pine climbing fern and Brazilian pepper in the areas that we passed, but, but we must have gotten pretty deep because I hadn't seen a single invasive species for nearly an hour. There was a skinny woman dressed all in white, standing on a patch of land covered in tall trees, but she wasn't facing us. She walked into the grass when we came near. Hey, lady! Is there good solid ground here? Will tried to ask. But she didn't respond in return. He shrugged. We decided to go through the verdant tunnel ahead of us. Most of the canopies were formed by mangrove, cypress, working together to hoard what passed for solid land in the natural state of Florida. And this one was particularly thick. This one was so thick that it blocked out the sun almost entirely, for about 400 feet, creating a dark tunnel of tropical colors, with only occasional holes for the dark orange and purple sunset to cast light through. There were tons of strange purple bromeliads, beautiful flowers that formed nest-like structures to grow from the crevices of trees and branches so that they would not need soil. Wow. What the fuck do you think brought it down? Will asked. I looked at him in incomprehension until he pointed at a spot in the canopy above us. In addition to the vines and flowers, letters could be seen through a rare area that wasn't covered in foliage. The canopy had been formed by a downed aircraft, and a big one by the looks of it. The Everglades used to enjoy a similar reputation to the Bermuda Triangle, and it wasn't uncommon at all to find old military service planes here and there throughout the wetlands. This particular wreck looked ancient, so it didn't surprise me that we had never heard of it. Well, I pity we don't have any choice in exploring the fuck out of this. It's gonna eat our time. Will quipped happily. Yeah, we pretty much have to, I said, after I'd recovered from my shock. Yeah, I'd say so, he said with a triumphant laugh. Abandoned places is going to absolutely shit its pants. I nodded in awe as we realized that what appeared to be a cockpit lay some distance ahead of us. The severed wing had propped itself up against a particularly hardy pond cypress tree that seemed to partially wrap itself around the metal as if embracing it. We set up camp, putting up our mosquito net over a natural lean-to created by the wing of the downed aircraft, and setting up every insect repellent known to man. On closer inspection, the formerly robust-looking tree that had seen some better days, the words La Sigu were spray-painted near the cockpit of the plane, but the vines obscured anything else. I would have camped elsewhere, but Will wanted to get a mosquito net up quickly and thought it looked cool. It was the winter which made the mosquitoes less of a problem, but not enough of a difference. 
The swamp could exsanguinate a cow in 30 minutes without enough deet. I couldn't blame him for wanting to get it ready. Once the sun was down, we decided to make a fire and warm up our dinner, consisting of some fish that we had caught. Grapes, spiderwort, swamp cabbage, betony, young cattail stalks, and ringless honey mushrooms, which we'd added together with some lettuce and ground provisions to make a gigantic weird salad, which was quite delicious. In addition, Will decided to rush ahead with some magic mushrooms, although not even close to a full dose. Just enough to make the scenery a little weird, I assumed. After some time, we noticed some soft blue lights and the sounds of people talking and laughing in the distance, and figured that we must not be too far from civilization after all. Cool. Maybe our neighbors might like to party, Will suggested. There was a wild peal of a woman's laughter that encouraged us to believe this was at least possible. After enjoying our salads, Will decided that we wanted to explore a bit. Despite it being late, I couldn't blame him. He headed straight for the cockpit of the downed craft. It had broken off from the fuselage and was laying face down in the water, which didn't exactly bode well for the pilots. One of the wings had been thrown several hundred feet ahead. Despite not being able to get the door to the cockpit open, he was able to find something interesting. Dude, how do we not hear about this? He asked in amazement. Probably went down years ago. I mean, the Everglades are full of these wrecks. We'd even passed an ancient Cessna that nature hadn't taken nearly as much of a liking to. No, it doesn't look like that's the case, he said, pointing to a laminated piece of paper that had survived the crash intact. At the top of the page was the date, only three months prior to us finding it. The list of passengers showed 19 passengers were originally on the list. What the fuck? I asked, in audible amazement. I set up a floodlight on the interior of what was once the craft and immediately saw that, despite Mother Nature's ferocity, there were many signs that it had once recently maintained life. Several first aid kits were still in the craft, only two of them open, and only one missing its contents. Some rations had been untouched and still in their packaging. Near the wing, we had not camped until there were signs of a campsite. Near the wing we had not camped under, there were signs of a campsite. After unpacking and preparing our camp, we decided to head out before the sun went down, to see as much as possible of the mysterious rag. There was only a single sign of death, a skeleton that we hadn't noticed in one of the darker areas of the fuselage that we had kayaked through. Its arms and legs held it to the wall of the fuselage by vines, allowing the partially shattered torso to sag slightly as if it had been crucified. It looked like it had been picked clean and now had a beautiful bromelade growing from one of its eye sockets, making it look like it had one dark purple and green eye. They still watched us with an amazed expression. There was a hole in the rib cage, and most of the bones around it wrenched forward slightly. If it weren't for the downed aircraft, I would have suspected a gunshot. Holy shit, dude, Will said, with an incredible sense of awe as he snapped the photo after with an incredible sense of awe as he snapped photo after photo. We have to check out the campsite. He was clearly thrilled despite the creepiness. He seemed ecstatic. I hope the trip went well for him. Will took as many pictures as possible, especially the beautiful skeleton, before we were back in our kayaks and maneuvered to the campsite on the opposite side of the fuselage amidst a group of small, grassy islands. It seemed strangely far away from a lot of decent, even partially covered places to sleep. Being out in the open on a small, easily submerged island generally is the worst spot to camp in the Everglades. Well, Will set up a floodlight so that we could see the area better. It had been a while since a fire had been started there, but there was another corpse, and this one was not nearly as picked clean. It was wearing a bright yellow sundress and still had some desiccated flesh sticking to the bones. Most of the skeleton was cured into a fetal position but one of its arms were several feet from where it was, and one of the legs had been shattered. A few feet away from the scene was a now extremely rusty revolver. I guessed and looked around the skeleton, was sure enough, deep in the sand there was a bullet, where someone must have shot this woman in the leg for some reason. What do you think happened? Will asked. And at first it seemed like a stupid question, until I thought about it. 
There were plenty of rations left in the plane. Plenty of ways to avoid exposure. She seemed to have a radio. There was no reason for whatever happened here to happen. I grabbed the rusty gun just in case something attacked them. Looks like someone shot her in the leg. Where is everyone else from the crash? Why the fuck wasn't this in the news? I asked aimlessly as Will was more wrapped up in his trip. We checked around the area of land, but I didn't see anything. I was about to suggest leaving, but Will began taking pictures of the wing, specifically the motor on the wing. Alright, there might be an award or something for this, Will said with delight. I turned the corner and found what had left him in a good mood. The propeller on the rig was filled to the brim, and I mean all the way, with dead corpses of birds. Most of them were just skeletons and feathers, but the mass of twisted birds looked like a horrible Halloween prop. Yeah. Yeah, we should contact the authorities right away. I mean, just... Just so we look all right. Will was a good guy, but he tended to be extremely focused on his search for personal luxuries, often to the point of causing problems for himself. I mean, you had to remind him from time to time. He was about to respond when suddenly we heard a loud shriek coming from our campsite. Oh man, I hope this doesn't turn into a bad trip, Will said. I didn't want to make things worse by telling him that we clearly had picked the wrong spot to camp. As we swung our kayaks to head back to our camp, we heard chittering, bizarre laughter. Someone ran through the tall grasses and said something along the lines of, I wish we had picked some up the last time we were at the store. And a high-pitched, slightly nasally woman's voice as if a normal conversation. Hey! Hey! Hello! I shouted. Will looked confused. Where did that come from? He asked. Suddenly another voice rang out. No, it was just a telemarketer. Get some rest. Whoever it was had this New York accent was somewhere behind us. But when we looked, there was only some water and grass. I flashed my light in the direction it came from, but saw only shadows moving. I started paddling away from whoever was speaking and towards the camp. Will looked terrified as we headed through the plane again, especially at the skull, which seemed to regard us with that same hostile amusement that it had when we first met it, and was now considerably less cool. Maybe we ought to just get the fuck out of here. Someone here wants to fuck with us. I'm sorry, man. I hope this doesn't fuck up your trip, I said with as much firmness in my voice as I could muster. Yeah, yeah, it's cool, it's cool, Will said very obviously to himself, and much to me. He was shaking pretty badly and seemed to be having some difficulty following me. I had to keep him from tripping over repeatedly. When we got to our lean-to camp, it was obvious someone had been through our stuff, and none of it was destroyed. Instead, all of our belongings had been laid out neatly outside of our tent in overlapping circles, like an insane Venn diagram. Most of the vegetation and scrap from the surrounding area had been cleared away. I could now see the spray paint on the side of the aircraft said La Siguapa in a desperate hand. Strange symbols now covered the cockpit as well. La Siguapa? I said aloud. I, I remembered a friend of mine telling me that it was a mythical demon from the Dominican Republic, but but he described it like it was some kind of mermaid. Dude, what the fuck? Will said, rushing to our tent to check for further damage. His flashlight lit up hundreds of bizarre symbols that had been painted on the interior of the mosquito net. I understand that the schedule is tight, but that meeting is a priority, came a stern woman's voice from a far distance. Dude, do you think that those are the people who survived the crash? Will asked, not even bothering to speak to whoever it was. For once, he had the right idea, and I hope he stuck to it. I just shook my head. I was shocked that anyone could survive a crash like that, but something was now clearly wrong with those fucking people. I would get them help later once the authorities came. I, I hope that Will wouldn't suggest going to speak with them. Well, where did the bodies go then? He asked quietly. There was a chance that the tail had broken off. Sucking people out. But it was hard to tell. And why had that skeleton been shot in the chest? Will sounded like he was breathing hard enough to hyperventilate. So I had to calm him down before he panicked further and then call the authorities. As if it was going to be easy to help us out there. Dude, where did the bodies go? Why did we not hear about a missing plane? What the fuck is happening here? He was freaking out. And he was raising the chances of both of us dying. He took out his cell phone and tried to make a phone call, but stared at his phone oddly for a moment. I can't get any reception to open a browser. And when I tried to make an emergency call, I heard, all I heard was a woman singing in Spanish. He almost cried in despair. Let me get in contact with the authorities. It's okay, dude. Just chill out for a second, okay? Just chill. I took out my own phone and tried to use every emergency system I had in place for the situation. 
My phone essentially told me to fuck off, even for emergency calls. I found our radio equipment surprisingly undamaged amongst the bizarre circle. Will smoked a joint the size of his forearm, which was a relief to see, considering his own situation. When I finally got a line of communication up, all I heard was a woman's voice, singing in this strange-sounding song, in a language I didn't recognize. I speak Spanish fluently, and whatever I was listening to had nothing to do with the language. It didn't even sound like a, a romance language. Every channel, every channel that should have been used seemed to play it endlessly, and I tried not to mention anything, but... Will probably noticed the look of frustration and began talking more rapidly for it. Hey, dude, maybe we should ask those people for help. There's some more over there. He pointed in the distance ahead of us, and I noticed some lights blossoming some ways away. A cold chill went up my spine, and I remembered the nonsense phrases that were uttered in response to us asking for help. And the gun near the woman. They didn't seem very helpful. I'm gonna set up a PLB first. A personal locator beacon, or PLB, was something that you wanted if you were going into the wild. His only job was to send out a powerful SOS that was difficult for search and rescue teams to miss. Then I fired up our satellite messenger, which should have allowed me to have access to Facebook and Twitter. Except this time, nothing loaded correctly. I turned the signal off, then on again. And it came out worse. Every single thing I read was in some weird language. It was bizarre symbols. Spelled out in otherwise blank web pages. I couldn't even use it to send out an SOS. So I kept the PLB in my pocket. Get anyone? Will asked with obvious fear in his voice. Getting him to calm down was difficult enough when he wasn't on shrooms. The SOS beacon is working. Okay, just give it some time, dude. It's cool. We may end up camping out here while we wait. I hoped he would listen to what I had said for once. Because if he lost his shit... We could end up in trouble out here. Death was not something I wanted to think about, but it was absolutely a possibility, especially with Will not being helpful. I was happy he was smoking weed, I mean, just to keep him out of the way. He must have loved it too, because nearly an hour went by before I heard from him again. Dude. Look. He said. Barely above a whisper. At the very far edge of the clearing. More than... 600 feet away from us, the woman we had seen earlier was standing quietly. Just like before, she was standing with her back to us, moving around as if she was working on something that we couldn't see. Her white blouse and khaki shorts hung from her body as she was utterly emaciated. Both of her hands and her legs were jet black with what looked like incredible bruising. A long river of black hair flowed to the ground. She was muttering strange phrases mixed with strange songs that I had heard on my phone. And I quietly tried to turn off my lights and warn Will. But it was too late. Hey lady, do you need some help? Will asked, shining his flashlight on her before I could even motion for him to shut the actual fuck up. A long, horrendous shriek emerged from the woman as she began to run at us at an incredible speed, while still backwards. Without thinking twice, I took the gun out of my pocket, hit the safety, and pulled the trigger in its general direction. But if I hit it, it didn't seem to do anything. Instead, I couldn't hear anything, and the fucking thing flew out of my hand. Will took a moment, staring in shock, but eventually followed my cue of running to the kayaks. Before I did, I noticed the woman's feet and knees seemed to move in a way that implied... They were facing us. Shit, 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 shit. I, I couldn't hear the words coming out of my mouth. The ringing in my ears covered everything up. Will was shouting something to me I couldn't make out as he pushed his kayak out with him laying on top of it instead of in it. I struggled to use my paddle to push myself as far away from the land as possible and almost landed in the water in the process but managed to keep my ship right. And then I looked back and I noticed small pale hands sticking out of the water in front of where Will was moving his kayak and I knew, I knew they were going to catch the small craft. I slowed down and reversed just slightly allowing him to slide onto the top of my kayak right as two pale bodies shot from the water, hair covering their faces and grabbed it. It was amazing mine didn't simply go under. Will was screaming something, and I paddled as hard as I could as Will cut loose any weight that he could find, including the only supplies that we had that weren't on the island. He managed to make it to the aircraft. When I looked back, the woman was still standing there, as, as well as two others, a man and a, a younger-looking girl. All had their backs facing the kayak that they were tearing apart, 
matted hair covering their faces. I paddled us through the aircraft. I saw that the strange flower growing from the skeleton was now glowing with a powerful blue light, just like the ones we had seen in the distance. Will and I stared in awe and horror as we realized what had become of the survivors. I wondered if perhaps the flower was the real culprit. I mean, it wasn't unheard of for some parasites to force their prey to perform labor. Perhaps, perhaps this was a similar mechanism. We paddled for at least a half an hour, only to find ourselves returning to the aircraft again. This time, a man stood just off to the side, not facing away from us, wearing absurdly baggy clothes. We kept quiet. We left. We kept coming back. Again and again. Another one eventually appeared on the edge of the aircraft, a child by the looks of it, who stood up as we neared and we left quietly every time. Without our GPS units, our chances of finding a way out were seemingly non-existent. And with Will laying on top of my craft, if, if one of those things chased us again, we would probably be joining them or getting eaten or who knows what. Will began to sob uncontrollably as we realized we had gone in a circle for the fourth or fifth time. I was, I was fucking exhausted. There were more of those things, those people, every time we came near. Well, we have to go back. He could see shock and horror across his face. No, no, man, I don't. Let's just keep trying. I could barely hear his words over the ringing in my ears. If we don't get our GPS map, we're never going to be able to figure out how to leave. Something's fucking with us. It's keeping us here. We need that thing, I said, knowing that sternness had crept into my voice. I could see his lips forming the words no over and over again, and it pissed me off. Do you want to die out here, Will? Because they'll be happy to help. Let's just do this. Let's get it done with. He seemed to quiet down after that. I padded in silence for another 15 minutes before we reached the edge of the aircraft again. Okay. Okay, we're going to do this as quickly as possible, I told him. He simply nodded in terror. We didn't see any more of them around the exterior of the aircraft. I paddled through the green tunnel until we came to the edge of the clearing where our belongings had been left. Will's kayak was ripped to shreds on the edge of the water. No creepy backwards people, though. We landed as quietly as possible, and Will slid off the kayak, allowing me to get free. Our stuff was in circles again, but this time, different circles. I looked through the one closest to us and found some batteries, but nothing else useful. Will poked around, but didn't seem very focused. Instead, he was watching the woods around us as he half ambled over to the wing where we had built our camp under. Hopefully, he was looking for supplies and not weed. We went back to searching and eventually found a radio and the GPS system. I put in the batteries and a kick to life. Albeit in a strange language, the map was still visible. I also grabbed the gun, which, although it had fallen... Hadn't gone far. Thank God La Siguapa didn't care for them. From every direction, that song was now following us slowly, steadily, getting closer. I stared in horror as the first one, then two, and at least half a dozen emaciated bodies came from the woods. Each had blackened arms and legs turned all the way around, and there were two that were very close to the kayak, and the gun didn't have many bullets left. Before I could think about it, I shot the tree that was holding up the airplane wing. The wing came down with a sickening crack and a tremor, landing on top of Will. He screamed a long, impossible scream, and even from the distance, one of our floodlights illuminated dark pink foam that had started to flow from his mouth. I backed away from my friend as he flailed pitifully against the structure, which had surely crushed his ribcage. I got better. Please help me. I got better. Will screamed and gurgled. The backwards people came rushing to him. And at first it looked like they were going to help, but then... Then the screaming intensified. As they ran to him, I could see their faces frozen in fearful grimaces, their eyes no longer seeing, their limbs blackened and turned around. They flocked to Will and seemed to be tearing the flesh off of his bones in strips. 
and I ran to the now undefended kayak. I'm sorry, I screamed as I fled, but the only response was the singing, growing louder. I managed to get out of there, and, and I got home the next morning. By then, park rangers were out in the exterior area, but they didn't seem to be searching for anyone. They drew their weapons at me when they saw me, but they lowered them after a tense moment or two of me begging for my life. They sunk my kayak and they told me not to mention any of what happened to anyone. I mentioned Will, but they just shrugged. They said, they said he's gone now. They had me fill out paperwork saying that he drowned on accident and that there wasn't going to be any investigation. He told me to never come back. And I plan on keeping that promise. And you? You should probably avoid the Everglades, too. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we've just started off 2021, hopefully pretty well here. It's been 10 years now since the channel's gotten started, and since then, man, we've kind of done a shit ton. If you'd like to check out more of what I've done, you can always follow me at twitch.tv slash mrcreepypasta to hear me recording live and where I talk kind of at length about myself and my life. And I want to give a very special thank you to all of you who support me on Patreon, because quite honestly, you guys help me keep the lights out of my house. And I can't thank you enough for that. A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Canon Lando Higuchi, Chumbinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G Weevil 3, Chris Lovin, Freddy Krueger, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Miranda Jeffries, Hogunshi, Justin Johnson, Raven Hart, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, this is my real name, no shit. Jason VB Wilson, Infernal One, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Someone You Love, S Man, Kiri the Sloth. Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much. Like, seriously. Thank you guys so, so much. And if you would like to be able to join them, you always can at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I love you guys. Seriously. All of you who support on Patreon, who follow, who subscribe, those of you who listen, and those of you who lurk. Thank you for the amazing 10 years and sweet dreams.